Good morning. I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. It's Wednesday, June 5th. And uh, I will begin with our public statement. We, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, renew our commitment to welcome and protect the rights of all people, regardless of age, race, color, creed, disability, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, economic status, and national origin. And we affirm the right of every person to live peacefully and without fear, and we will fight and resist at every step discrimination and harmful policies, whatever their source. Uh, we also stand in support of our county public school systems, both RBB and uh, MCCSC. Uh, before we get to department updates, we do have two proclamations to offer. Um, and I, <clears throat> I forgot to note for the record that all three commissioners are present in the Nat U Hill room. It's that kind of day. Um, and the first one is for Pride Month. Um, whereas we applaud the U.S. Supreme Court's past role in protecting and expanding LGBTQ plus rights, including <clears throat> the legalization of same-sex marriage and barring workplace discrimination against LGBTQ plus people, and we continue to support such protections for the LGBTQ plus uh, and the people and their rights and have been deeply dismayed to see recent LGBTQ plus climate now in evidence across the nation and in our state. Whereas last year more than 300 anti-LGBTQ plus bills were filed in state houses nationwide, and Indiana lawmakers filed three times the number of anti-LGBTQ plus bills compared to any year in the past. Such actions negatively affect LGBT, LGBTQ plus people, and in particular, LGBTQ plus youth. And according to the Indiana Youth Institute, nearly 23% of high schoolers are seriously considering attempting suicide in 2021. And of those students, 65% self-identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. And whereas due to this anti-LGBTQ plus climate, we believe it is more important than ever to reaffirm our support of and commitment to protections for the rights of LGBTQ plus people. And in support of Pride Month, we will be flying the Pride flag throughout the month of June at the Monroe County Courthouse. And we say every week in our opening statement, we affirm the right of every resident of Monroe County to live peacefully and without fear. Now, therefore, we, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, proclaim June 2024 as Pride Month in Monroe County. Proclaim this fifth day of June, 2024. Thank, Thank you so much. Our second proclamation <clears throat> is for Gun Violence Awareness Day. Whereas every day 120 Americans are killed by gun violence and more than 200 are shot and wounded with an average of nearly 18,000 gun homicides every year. Americans are 26 times more likely to die by gun homicide than people in other high-income countries. And in an average year, 1,111 people die by guns in Indiana, with a rate of 16.4 deaths per 100,000 people. Between 2013 and 2022, the rate of gun deaths in Indiana increased by a disturbing 34%. Local governments across the nation, including in Monroe County, are working to end the senseless violence with evidence-based solutions. And whereas gun violence prevention is more important than ever, as we see an increase in firearm homicides and non-fatal shootings across the country, increased calls to domestic violence hotlines, and an increase in gun violence. And in Monroe County, we took the unique step of using American Rescue Plan Act funds to purchase gun locks and gun safes to help reduce the number of accidental gun deaths and to reduce the number of gun thefts from vehicles. And in January 2023, Hadia Pendleton was tragically shot and killed at age 15. And on June 7, 2024, sorry, to recognize Hadia's 27th birthday, 
People across the United States will recognize National Gun Violence Awareness Day and wear orange in tribute to one, Hadia Pendleton and other victims of gun violence, and to the loved ones of those victims. And the idea was inspired by a group of Hadia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange. They chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods. And orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And by wearing orange on June 7th, 2024, Americans will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the hands of people who should not have access to them and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our families and communities safe. Now, therefore, we, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim Friday, June 7th, 2024, to be Gun Violence Awareness Day in Monroe County. We encourage all residents of Monroe County to join us in our effort to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor the victims of gun violence and all who love them. Proclaim this fifth day of June, 2024. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, and um, there is an event on Friday. There it is, here at the courthouse, 8 p.m. Very good. Um, and um, I want to also um, offer, before we get to department updates, offer ours, which is um, a note to um, congratulate all of the local graduates um, across the entire county. A hearty, hearty congratulations. And I'd also like to congratulate the Bloomington High School North girls track and field team for placing second in the state and to the boys team at Bloomington High School North for uh, finishing third. It's quite an accomplishment to get there, especially when you're competing against high schools that are so much bigger. But I especially want to acknowledge um, Hadley Lucas, who not only um, was first in the state in both shot put and in discus, but she set state records in both of those events, which is quite an accomplishment. This young woman has clearly worked very hard, and I want to um, acknowledge her excellent, excellent hard work and her outcome. And I also want to compliment Sarah Haminovich, our friend who um, is the owner and operator of Vet Engineering, uh, who was, um, was and probably still is Hadley's coach. Yeah, very nice. All right, uh, let's see what other department updates we have. Um, Health Department, Ms. Kelly, good morning. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Just a few updates for you today. So COVID wastewater detections have continued to increase slightly, as well as ED visits um, for COVID-like illness. The Health Department will be offering free blood pressure screenings at the City of Bloomington Juneteenth celebration at Switchyard Park from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m on June 15th. And as always, we have vaccines available at our public health clinic. You can call 812-353-3244 for more information. All right, thank you so much. Comments or questions? Commissioner Githens? No. Commissioner Jones? No. Okay. All right, uh, thank you so much. We appreciate that update. And uh, let's see if there are any other departments that have an update for us. Good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> I'm here on both behalf of the clerk and the election board. Tomorrow's meeting for the election board was canceled, and so I just had a couple of updates that we were going to discuss there. Um, the deadline for school board candidates uh, to file is June 20th at noon. And then also, um, we just wanted to give a little bit of an update on votes. We had 14,432 voters out of the 91,357 that were registered. And then I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you for those updates. I appreciate you being here in person to yeah. offer that. 
Um, and that's uh, really, really useful, especially since you're not meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions or? I just want to remind people that aren't currently registered to vote. That they, they can be registering to vote right now for yep. the November election. Correct. And I would like to remind people who are registered to vote that. <laughs> An awful lot of them didn't. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty sad. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you, guys. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, any other departments have an update for us? Okay. I do have a couple of other quick um, updates um, tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, at the Ellettsville Fire Station. We're holding our second. Um, public meeting um, regarding the potential location of the um, justice complex, including the new jail at North Park. Uh, so again, 6 p.m. tonight at the Ellettsville Fire Station, and many thanks to Ellettsville for uh, hosting us. Uh, very kind to do so and gave us a great space to utilize. Uh, we had a really uh, good turnout on Sunday and uh, we all learned a lot, so um, look forward to tonight's discussion. Um, and uh, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, June 6, um, the um, county um, residents um, against annexation are uh, leaders, local leaders from the county residents against annexation uh, are going to be honored here uh, in the rotunda at 6 p.m. Uh, for all of their efforts. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, that's at 5 p.m. Did I say 6 p.m.? It is at 5 p.m. Yeah. tomorrow. 6, 6 at 5 p.m., I know. Uh, <laughs> and um, we just want to um, give a shout out to all those folks who um, spent so much time and energy um, during that remonstration period to make sure that people's voices were heard. It was a huge effort and, and that's our opportunity to thank them. All right, um, anything else for the good of the order? Okay, um, all right, so next we will go to um, public comment. Uh, public comment is reserved uh, for items that are not on our agenda. Uh, you may come to the podium in Nat U Hill or raise your hand on Teams. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to our um, next agenda item, please. I move approval of the minutes from May 29th, 2024. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Any comments at its corrections? I sent uh, some corrections to Nita Freeman and she has already taken care of them, so. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Anything else? Okay. Excellent. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes for May 29th, 2024, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 3-0. Next item, please. We have approval of the claims docket for accounts payable June 5th, 2024. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Auditor Gregory, tell us all about it, please. Yes. Good morning, commissioners. The accounts payable claims docket for today, June 5, 2024, totals $14,425,651.84. That includes all emergency claims and adjustments. I do want to note that the, um, there is a, an ARPA claim for the Karst Farm Fields project. So um, that's a little over $65,000. So things are moving along. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, comments? Uh, or questions, Commissioner Jones? No, Commissioner Giffins? Um, I have a couple. Um, lines one through three of page 15 of the regular claims docket, I believe that the um, fund number and the um, description number that are in there are incorrect, and I hope that those will be corrected later. Um, we only get these things a day in advance, so yeah. it's hard to reach out yeah. to, to different folks to get those taken care of, but I had checked with the um, with Kim Shell and the council office, and no, those were not fund numbers that were listed on uh, what was approved by the budget last year by the county council. So hopefully 
working with the auditor, we can get this taken care of. Um, the only reason I'm asking that it not be, that I'm not asking for it to be delayed is that this is a local vendor and I don't want that mm -hmm. vendor to have their payment messed up. Um, I also want to note, though, too, that there were three rural housing repair items mm -hmm. on the claims for this this time. And one was, I think, for a foundation, one was for an HVAC and water heater, and the third one for windows. And so we are making a difference in the county. We have maxed out at this point in time, and I've reached out to the local townships um, to let them know, and um, hopefully we'll be getting another ARPA meeting between you and the county council to see if they would everybody would consider adding some additional funds to this particular project. I think it's one of the best projects that you guys yeah. have had. Yeah, and, but we are not discouraging people from applying. We're just saying that we don't have funds and we don't know that we'll have funds, but please apply, get in the queue in case we do get some. I would, yes, but I talked to the townships and I don't want them to keep them. Sure. Sure. I, can, I don't want to be responsible for mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. maintain those. So the, the email that went to the township trustees was that they could continue to accept applications, um, but to please not forward them to me <laughs> until we know if, right. if there's additional funding. Right. And we'll just accept, we'll then review them by date received at the yeah. township. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Okay. All right, see none. All those in favor of approving the claims docket, accounts payable June 5th, 2024, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 3 0. We have not received, uh, did not receive any reports uh, for today, and we will move on to new business, please. We have approval of the 2024 covered bridge certification. Mm -hmm. Second. We have a motion and we have a second, Ms. Gregory. Yes, um, this is one of. Uh, the many requirements um, in Indiana code, the, one of the annual um, housekeeping items that we do. So this is just a request for you to um, certify that we still have one covered bridge in Monroe County. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Gitsons. Oh, it's a beautiful bridge. <laughs> it's a gorgeous bridge. <laughs> Commissioner Jones. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth taking the drive. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yes, I will not dispute that we have one beautiful covered bridge. Can we put the word beautiful in there? No. All right. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the 2024 covered bridge certification signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries three to zero. Next item, please. We have approval of the Memorandum of Understanding with Summit Hill regarding American Rescue Plan Act funded affordable housing and child care project. Fund name, ARPA, fund number 8950 in an amount of $700,000. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Mr. Cockrell. Yes, this was a project that was approved by both the commissioners and funded by the county council. It is to give up to $700,000 for a child care center with affordable housing uh, apartments above that. Um, this is kind of a, it's a lost revenue project. I, I would say that the one major difference between these and some of the other lost revenue projects is that in this one, we are actually going to front 175,000 for cash flow purposes. And then as they give us invoices, we'll continue to, to keep that level until the 700,000 is has run, but they're still responsible for giving us the full $700,000 worth of invoices. So we know all the funds were spent for this project. Um, other than that, I think it's kind of typical of what we've seen in these agreements. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Githens. Um, I know that when this finally, when this was approved that I was talking with Nate Ferreira who uh, was overseeing this and he said this was the final piece they needed to get this project off of mm -hmm. the ground, uh, which is pretty incredible. It's a multi-million dollar project. But also the child care is specifically aimed right now at infants and toddlers and that's where the greatest need is in our, our community, for child care for the, that age of children. Absolutely. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, this is it's just exciting to 
see this getting going, and uh, it's one of the more important projects that we've taken on. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and it and I appreciate the the child care component, um, affordable housing. It ticks all the boxes uh, for what we need in this community. So, really appreciate um, everyone's hard work to make this happen. And um, I know Commissioner Gittins played a played a big role in bringing this to fruition. So, thank you for that. All right, uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the MOU with Summit Hill regarding ARPA funded affordable housing and child care projects signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 3 0. Next item, please. Move approval of the contract with VET Environmental for phase two study of for the Hunter Valley Road Marth Park potential jail site. Fund name, edit bond, fund number 4816 in amount of $28,417.95. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Mr. Cockrell. Yes, this, uh, this agreement falls after we anybody was surprised that a phase two was warranted uh, given the location I guess uh, one of the things and we may bring this to you at a future meeting but we're exploring doing the soil sampling down to bedrock uh, given the the site use next door um, just to make sure that the PCB issues we know about and make sure that we, we uh, understand those uh, I think the biggest difference between this and the phase two so we've done in the past is that there's an archaeological assessment um, mm -hmm. This was recommended by Vet Environmental, um, so and that was sixteen thousand plus mm -hmm. dollars of that of that amount. So I just kind of wanted to make you aware that that's why this one's a, a little bit higher than what we've seen in the past. Thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones. Yeah. yeah. Do you happen to know what um, caused Vet Environmental to suggest the archaeological study? I think it's probably got a lot to do with the uh, quarrying in the area, and also probably has a little bit to do with the inner or with the, the highway having been built there. I think those are kind of the two. I know that the, I know with the uh, the consultation life has to do. I, I believe primarily with the stream and the old quarries. So I think that is a, a big part of it. Thank you. Commissioner Gissens? Um, I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to point this out. Stuff done too, where they did soil work, but that was to look at the how compacted the soil could mm -hmm. be, which is weight bearing, load bearing kind of issues. Mm -hmm. This is to look at the composition and what kind of contaminants might be in that soil and the impact they might have on locate, locating the jail there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and just so um, people understand, this is part of um, sort of that background research that we have to do before um, any property um, is selected as a site. Um, and that is just an indicator that while we are meeting with the public uh, this week and uh, DLZ is working um, with the various departments in the criminal justice side of county government uh, gathering data in order to uh, launch the design process as quickly as possible once a site is identified um, these are the things that that have to get done uh, in the meantime so we're um, spinning multiple plates at one time even though on the surface it may not look like much is going on um, all right, let's see if there's any public comment on this. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the VET Environmental Phase 2 study for Hunter Valley Road, North Park, uh, potential jail site, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries three to zero. I actually have a follow-up question, Mr. Cockrell. Uh, so we would have to do a separate uh, contract to do the core samples to bedrock? I, I think what would happen is we'd bring it to you as an amendment to this mm -hmm. contract. Okay, okay. We, to, uh, we reached out to them. Um, they indicated that they 
we're going to put together a pricing and things for that. And I, okay. we just didn't have it yet. And we wanted to make sure they got going. Great. Perfect. In June. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So motion passed three zero. We'll move on to the next item, please. Yes, move approval of resolution 2024-21, establishing the Opioid Settlement Application Review Board. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, it looked like Ms. And I, and I can, you're going to do this I, I one for us. Thank you, Mr. Cockrell. Thank yes, um, as I think we're all aware that the opioid, the county has been involved in the opioid litigation and therefore in the state then later became involved and now we are starting to receive the compensation for the issues that we described in that litigation caused by the, the opioid issues. Um, the working group has indicated that we're going to do an application process where people can come in and make requests for using of these funds. And so this is a formal committee to look at that process and look at those applications to make recommendations to the, to the commissioners and, all, and the council. Uh, it will consist of six members, five of which are voting members. Um, one would be a person with lived experience chosen by the Board of Commissioners. One would be a representative of the Health Department, again chosen by the Board of Commissioners, a representative without any strings attached by the Board of Commissioners, a representative uh, that the County Council appoints, and a representative from the Board of Judges. Uh, the non-voting member would be a member of the auditor staff because they need to be need to be knowledgeable on how we're spending our money. Um, I think there, there was, and one of the ways this is different than a lot of our other boards is that we understand w that with a, that there may be conflicts with board members and certain applications, um, namely that they're involved with that organization. And these are going to be reviewed quarterly. So this indicates that if someone has to recuse themselves for any item that quarter, they recuse themselves for all items that quarter just to make sure it's consistent that they're consistent reviews of all the applications at that point in time. So that's really the big difference uh, than what we see with most of our board. So if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Uh, comments or questions? Commissioner Gittins. Um, I want to thank the people who've been working on this, on the working group, first of all, um, that's laid the basis for all this and um, auditor, um, our Auditor Bree, <laughs> sorry, I think of you that way, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ms. Gregory, okay, uh, has been part of that as well and, and helping to define what that should look like. Um, there will be across the 18 years or more that, that will be receiving money, there will be, um, I think, close to $5 million that will be coming through the county to help with people who um, have substance use disorders. And so this is a way to help with harm reduction, to help with um, recovery as much as we can. And um, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a, an issue in our community. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jones, comments or questions? Um, so we have had the working group for quite some time and um, the working group said this should be um, a a regular thing. This should be something, right? And um, and because we're talking about something that is both appropriated, county council, and something where there's typically a contract involved, county commissioners. That's why the board is is com composed as it is um, right now and then in the future. Um, so I do I do appreciate your service uh, on that. Um, all right, so let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Mr. King is now in ah. the room. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I am kind of here in, on behalf of council members who have expressed some, um, who have a proposal regarding the composition of the board. Um, Right now, it's a six-member board with an ex-officio member, so five appointments. Um, I think there's been expressed hesitation from the courts with having an appointment because a lot of court entities will be applying uh, for 
the use of opioids, so probation problem solving courts. And so I guess I'm asking uh, for maybe some consideration on the appointments um, and the number of members of boards are on the board. I think there are several ways you could do to possibly reconfigure it. Uh, it could become a three-member board. You could eliminate the judge appointment and give it to the, make that person a council appointment. And so I know Mr. Iverson has some thoughts on this as well. I'm just uh, expressing a little concern that I've heard. Thank you. Um, so this is something we, um, I think one of my questions would be for um, Commissioner Githens and maybe Mr. Cockrell about timing. Is there anything about this um, making this a um, review board instead of a working group? Is there anything that's urgent in the next three weeks um, where we do need to have um, a meeting as a review board? Um, or can, is this something we could table ostensibly until uh, the end of June uh, for consideration? Does anybody? Um, I think we need something in place uh, in early July because we have the first cutoff for application at the end of June and there okay. have been a few applications. Okay. They've been coming in through the auditor's office. Okay. Um, but but I, could... I don't see any problem with, with moving this back, especially after we hear other comment here. Okay. So that's something we could do. Okay. I think Great. so. Thank you. Uh, because we can always, and, and once it's created as well, we can always change the membership. It's not, it's not, you know, uh, cast but, in uh, stone here. So. But I think it is critical to have somebody from our health department and people with lived experience because they, they have such valid input on things like harm reduction and mm -hmm. the need for recovery housing and other kinds of treatment mod modalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We do want an odd number yeah. <laughs> on this yeah. group, I think. Yeah. Right. Um, any other public comment on this item? Thank you, commissioners, for your consideration of this. And I, I sincerely appreciate uh, the uniqueness of this situation with these funds coming in. And I think the only comment that I could make here that would add to the conversation is for those in the public that want to apply for this funding, the uh, auditor's office has put that application on our website under important news. So you can apply now. Those applications are open till June 30th. Yeah, June 30th. So uh, those will be on a rolling basis every quarter. So thank you, commissioners, for your work on this very important topic. Can I add something after that? Please, Mr. Cockrell. Uh, according to the, the applicant must be, and this is in the, the ordinance, so, I, so when people hear, hey, you can apply here, the applicant must be an, organi an organization that is a not-for-profit entity registered as a 501c3 or 501c19 or a county department working on combating substance use, or an individual that meets the criteria to be a certified addiction peer recovery coach one or two and is seeking funding for both training and testing. And we, we are not allowing the city of Bloomington, town of Ellettsville, or the town of Steinsville to apply, I believe, because they are also members who are eligible to receive opioid settlement right. funding. Great. And I will also add that that language that Mr. Cockrell just quoted is verbatim from the application process, which is available online. Great. Thank you. But if, if there is an organization, a 501c3, that um, maybe their 501c3 address is in the city of Bloomington, but they want to do a program outside the city boundaries specifically, that that's something that may be considered. I don't think it prevents people who are, whose addresses are inside the city limits from applying right. for this. I mean, all, we, we have repeatedly acknowledged that residents of Bloomington are residents of Monroe County. Yeah, so. exactly. All right. yeah. And, and Commissioner Githens, if I could add to that, this resolution does uh, suggest that when an organization, this body reviews these, it'll come to the commissioners first for your review, and it'll come to the council for the appropriation. So there will be a review process for these to cover topics just like that. Thank you. All right, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a motion to table resolution 2024-21 until our meeting on June 26th. I second that. All right, any other? 
Okay. Uh, all those in favor of tabling resolution 2024 until the June 26 meeting signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 3-0. Thank, Thank you. you. May I add that in the meantime, if people, people want to reach out with suggestions, that they can email me at my county e email address at pgiffins at co.monroe.in.us uh, about who could serve as the kind of, in terms of a, uh, an umbrella mm -hmm. title, mm -hmm. um, but not the individual who, who might serve on that, this kind of advisory <laughs> review committee. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, next item, please. Sorry, All right, got to catch up. Move approval of the NDOT change order number two. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, is Ms. Lisa, Rich? Lisa is not here, ah, okay. and she has asked <laughs> me to present it knowing full well that I do not know how to determine whether concrete is properly cured. Um, but this is a change order. I think we had a similar one a couple weeks ago where we, where the state has approved a different way to, to test the, the concrete. And this is just uh, changing the contract so that they can use that alternative testing model. Um, it's, it's no cost. It's no time frame difference. It's just they want to use a different method to test the concrete. Mm -hmm. That has been approved by the state. Great. Thank you so much. I actually understand just enough of this for it to be dangerous, so. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do get it. So uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Uh, yes, I would agree that I think I understand this well enough to vote on it, but um, I was actually kind of looking forward to possibly having Ms. Ridge explain exactly what all of this means, but <laughs> that might not have been fair. <laughs> and wait for another day. Yes. All right. Commissioner Giffins. I, I try to read these several days in advance in case I have questions for the, the different departments. And I, I was sitting with my husband, and I start laughing, going, we're supposed to know about this? <laughs> we're supposed to understand mm -hmm. all this? So um, yeah, we, we do get a lot of variety in what we, we review. We do. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see if there's any uh, public comment on this item. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Just don't ask us any engineering questions. Seeing none, all those in favor of in-dot change order number two signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 3-0. Next item, please. We have approval of ordinance 2024-24 to amend the zoning of chapter 814, permit and certificates. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. We have Ms. Nestor Jellen, the director of planning online. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So this morning, I just have a very simple text amendment to our chapter 814. The reasoning for the text amendment is to just expand upon the administrator's ability to place conditions of approval for issuing an improvement location permit. That's the planning permit that we issue. Uh, this is aligning with recent case law, especially around uh, sides. So the text amendment here in red is all that we're adding. And it basically just says the administrator, uh, the black text is existing, the red text is new. So it says the administrator may condition approval on the receipt of other permits, certificates, and or approvals, C subsection 815-3C, as necessary to ensure compliance with the provisions of the ordinance, e.g. an approval conditional upon on relocating a structure to comply with relevant setback provision. And I can take any questions. Thank you so much. Comments, questions? Commissioner Githens. No, we heard about this at last week's uh, work session, so thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Jones. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense, and uh, I think we'll more easily for the plan department. I agree. I appreciate you brought this uh, forward so quickly. Um, Let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving Ordinance 2024-24 uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 3-0. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item, please. Yes. yes, move approval of ordinance 2024-26, stormwater management ordinance adoption. Second. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Ms. Thetonia. Good morning, commissioners. Can I ask tech services to please allow me to share my screen? Kelsey Latonia, MS4 coordinator with the Monroe County Highway Department. I oversee the county stormwater utility MS4 program, which is the municipal separate storm sewer system program, um, and work with the county drainage board and, of course, the county stormwater management board. So I'm presenting to you today a complete rewrite of the county drainage ordinance, Chapter 761. Um, also called the County Stormwater Management Ordinance. So this was in the works since about 2018, but has really um, become necessary due to a state requirement for all MS4 entities to update their stormwater regulations to comply with new standards. So I gave this presentation at your work session last week. I can go into as much detail as we'd like on certain topics. Otherwise, I'll plan to just quickly go through an overview of the ordinance. Um, I can talk about individual sections if you'd like, or if you'd like me to move along, I can do that as well. I also would like to touch on those, uh, what I didn't talk about so much last week. It's going into a little bit more detail on implementation and enforcement. I've received some questions on that. I'd like to clarify some items. Okay. okay. So this ordinance was first passed by the county in 1997. It was called the Monroe County Drainage Code. And it was the first thing the county passed that addressed drainage and flooding concerns in the county and how to address new development. And then later in the 90s, um, the state passed regulations requiring counties to have regulations just like this. And so we were ahead of the game at that time. And then Again, in the late 90s is when um, phase two of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NPDES permit program, um, was part of the 19, um, part, part of the Clean Water Act, was then um, implemented to regulate construction sites and MS4s, which were designated by population size or urban areas within counties. Um, and then in the 2000s, Monroe County was um, required to comply with the MS4 regulations. And so we had to update our regulations at that time. So in 2004 is when we first updated our regulations to comply with um, the updated state rules, which at the time were known as Rule 5 and Rule 13. And then um, in 2011, we updated the regulations to include water quality regulations, basically meaning for anything um, any new developments we required to have some type of water quality treatment on their property to help um, capture and treat pollutants that result from urbanizing land uses. In 2018, um, our stormwater program contracted with Christopher Burke Engineering to do a complete rewrite of Chapter 761. This is because over the years, since it was first written in the 90s, technology changes and how we know stormwater infrastructure operates, um, requires maintenance, and can be just designed in more efficient ways. Uh, we needed to overhaul the regulations to better capture that and make the ordinance itself clearer to the public and our engineers on how to design infrastructure. There were just some gaps in the current Chapter 761 that need to be addressed. So, um, Chris Burke Engineering is responsible for the county's, uh, the county, the state's uh, model stormwater management ordinance that is made available through Purdue University's local technical assistant program or LTAP. And so Chris Burke's model stormwater ordinance is used 
throughout the state for various MS4 programs. So it is very comprehensive and it is written by the, some of the best engineers in the state who really know drainage law and drainage regulations. They are the actual authors of the state's drainage handbook. Now the model ordinance um, is, like I said, it's a model, so it's not a one size fit all. We had to do extensive work to make it work for our community, for our local area, and tailor it to those areas we want to address, specifically karst, um, logging, some other issues that aren't addressed in that model ordinance. So it took us many years to work through all of that. Along the way, some other things have happened. In 2020, um, we saw that they, the ordinance wasn't moving quickly enough. The drainage board implemented a temporary um, regulation for critical watersheds, which are areas where we have um, issues with flooding, um, downstream flooding issues, or just general sensitive features we need to protect. So for new development, those properties being developed would go to the drainage board for approval and would have more stringent stormwater drainage design regulations. In 2021, Rule 5 and Rule 13 were repealed, and instead, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management had to implement um, the stormwater regulations for the state through administratively issued permits, and this was a requirement of the EPA. Leave it there. Um, so that's how most other states do these stormwater reg regulations is through um, administratively issued permits. They are the MS4 general permit and the construction stormwater general permit. So that was in December of 2021. That is what has triggered us to update our ordinances. Every single MS4 in the state is required to update their ordinances and we have a deadline of July of this year to do it. So we, we took as much time as we could to make sure the ordinance was comprehensive and complete and what we need it to be. So the stormwater ordinance itself, it regulates drainage. We have development standards. It incorporates our illicit discharge regulations as well, um, as well as a stormwater permit program for any land disturbing activities in the county. To go with the ordinance, we have several exhibits, but the main two I wanna to bring to your attention are the technical standards manual and the construction specifications. These are gonna to apply to new developments in the county and any permanent stormwater um, infrastructure, detention ponds, pipes, and anything that conveys or treats stormwater in the county, these are the standards that they will be held to for design and maintenance and replacement of that infrastructure. The ordinance itself, um, like I said, it is a complete rewrite, so it's not possible to do a red line version, um, but we are essentially replacing all of the text of chapter 761 with this new ordinance. At the same time, we are repealing Chapter 767, which has our illicit discharge regulations in there, and it's been incorporated into this new Chapter 761. So I'm gonna go through each of these sections briefly. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go. I also wanna point out on the slide, there are a total of four exhibits associated with this ordinance. I highlighted the first two, the Technical Standards Manual, the construction specifications. We also have the Indiana Stormwater Quality Manual incorporated. They have details in that manual for um, how to design specific erosion control practices. So we've incorporated that into the ordinance as well as DNR's um, BMP or Best Management Practices Field Guide for Logging Activities. That also describes practices and details how to install them and when for logging activities in the county. If you look at the exhibits, I, I wanna point out there is a, exhibit one is large and it has an appendix that is several hundred pages long. So <laughs> um, that is um, more details on all the different practices that are available to designers to implement on their site. So there's a lot of information there. Um, so I just wanna let you know that I don't expect everyone to be experts on it all, um, but our local engineers will become very familiar with that exhibit in particular. And so, so in general, the purpose of the ordinance, again, it's a drainage ordinance, um, protecting public health, safety, and the environment is our main goal here. The ordinance itself 
is very broad in its applicability section because it's covering illicit discharge. It's covering basically any, any um, pollutants that could enter our stormwater. The general applicability section of the ordinance itself is going to be different than the stormwater permit applicability. So that's why we have a couple different applicability sections here and I wanna make sure that's clear. Not all land disturbing activities will require a stormwater permit. All stormwater discharges must comply with the illicit discharge portion of the regulations. So um, that's why the applicability section is so far reaching. Um, so the illicit discharge regulation, we, this is in line with what the state requires. Any pollutants entering the storm sewer system or our waterways, we have an enforceable ordinance um, uh, to help um, remove illegal connections, to um, prevent illegal dumping, or to pursue enforcement if we find that there have been discharges to waterways. Um, we have spill response procedures in there as well. And um, let's see, and just in general, the ability to um, investigate an issue if we suspect that there is a source of pollution entering our waterways. Again, this is standard language that is, what we're exempting is no more stringent than what the state requires and what other MS4s require. Pollution prevention for land disturbing activities. Um, so this is the regulation that ties to the state requirements for coverage under the state's general permit. IDEM does not enforce the state general permit if it's within an MS4 area. So local MS4s are required to have their own construction stormwater regulations that mirror the state's and they have to be at least as stringent as the state's requirements. There, I didn't change much in the model ordinance for this section in particular, except I wanna point out that we do have additional language in there to protect sensitive areas. That includes steep slopes, wetlands, karst areas, that's defined in the ordinance. It says land disturbance on sites containing sensitive areas or near sensitive areas, for example, areas sloped greater than 12%, may require redundant erosion control measures or engineered erosion control design. It's going to be very site specific. So during plan review, we would be able to work with the designer, whether it's an engineer or a surveyor, to determine the appropriate level of protection based on the sites, the slopes, its soils, et cetera. We already do that in a sense, but we're formalizing it now. So, again, we have a couple different levels of requirements here. We, we have requirements for large sites that require state permit coverage, so that is made clear. For very small sites that are disturbing, you know, half an acre to an acre that aren't part of a big construction site. Um, they still need to meet the pollution prevention standards, but they won't be required to do the self-monitoring program and, and other things that are required for the larger sites. We have a section on pollution prevention for silvicultural activities. This is something we added in because it's not in the model ordinance. It's not regulated um, at the state level, but locally we have some level of control over um, timber harvesting activities, specifically commercial timber harvesting and any land clearing associated with an intent for development. Um, so again, I had DNR look through this with me and they didn't have any additional comments. This is what the direction that they hoped we would go in. And so we'll see how it goes. Um, again, no one has implemented regulations like this before in other counties. So we're going to be um, working with our local companies and DNR to figure out the best solution. Next section is stormwater quantity and quality. Um, these are the regulations that, they're already in place, but we are refining them, making some things more stringent, um, where we require detention, basically holding back a excess runoff from a development site, um, and doing a controlled release based on what our streams can handle for large flood events. We also have a requirement for additional water quality treatment measures based on the land use. So if we have something going in that's industrial or you know, uh, fueling areas, things like that, we can require additional treatment measures that's actual um, filters, things that capture stormwater and filter it, um, oil water separators, things like that to help um, with the long-term pollution prevention on a site based on land use. Um, our 
Local engineers and surveyors have had access to the technical standards manual for several years now, and I've asked them to start incorporating these requirements into plan review over the past few years. A lot of this won't be new for them, so. We have a section on drainage easements. Not much has changed for the drainage easement language, but I think making the language clearer on when we require a drainage easement, how to size it. Carson sinkhole management, this is new for the stormwater program to be regulating. Right now, we rely on, um, I believe, Chapter 829 in the planning ordinance. Um, but we've taken on some of the stormwater provisions for Carson sinkhole management into the stormwater ordinance. Um, specifically, we want to look at water quality uh, and protecting sinkhole areas. Um, so we are defining a Karst Conservancy area um, with a bit more protection than what the county currently requires with that 25 foot from the largest closed contour. Our goal is to create a Karst overlay so that our local surveyors don't need to delineate drainage areas to sinkholes. Um, but we're trying to get away from just the general circle above a sinkhole and have it more defined on the sinkhole itself to um, better protect the drainage area. Um, after a lot of uh, research and investigation from our drainage board, our geologists on the drainage board. Um, so that will be in progress over time and we hope to roll that out in the coming years. Um, we also have a policy for emergence of new karst features. So on construction sites that anytime you do excavation in the county, there's a risk of uncovering new karst features. So. Okay, so the stormwater permit requirements, this applicability, like I said, is different than the general overarching applicability of the ordinance. So this is just those activities that require you to apply for a stormwater permit. Any project requiring coverage under the state's construction stormwater general permit will require a local permit. We've also set a threshold of half an acre or more of land disturbing activity and including new single-family residential dwellings. Our target for this is the new single-family residential dwellings because right now there's not a lot of oversight on lot grading. And over the years, we've had enough issues with lot grading. Um, we want to better protect new homeowners from flooding issues, drainage is issues, future foundation concerns. Um, those reviews for the smaller sites will not be as rigorous as the larger sites. And we're going to be streamlining the process, working with local designers to hopefully not make this a burden on new um, homeowners, but still offering some level of oversight and protection. We're trying to find that happy medium there. Any project requiring detention or water quality treatment will also require a stormwater permit. I did not change the threshold from our current chapter 761 that's set at 4,000 square feet of new impervious surface for projects like you know, commercial and industrial development. Uh, modifications to sinkholes or karst features will also require a stormwater permit. Again, this is to ensure um, protection of surface water and groundwater. And then construction or removal of dams is also another example. There are a few other things in the applicability section of the ordinance itself, um, but that covers um, most of the items that will require a permit. So. Okay, so in general, some of these new requirements of the ordinance, um, again, applying for this permit via our OpenGov permitting portal. Um, we hope to have it streamlined enough and set up so that someone who needs to get a stormwater permit doesn't have to spend too much time deciding exactly what permit they need to apply for. We'll have a general stormwater permit and do an intake and then be able to require additional documentation for some of the more complex projects. Um, the implementation of that, we're working with planning. I just want to thank um, Jackie and the other planning staff tremendously for helping us with this transition. Um, any developer who would normally apply for a grading permit for a large site, say a site plan or a PUD, would, um, instead of applying for that grading permit, would just apply for a stormwater permit, and it should be a very similar process. Um, the f fact that we're taking the, the old Rule 5 or stormwater regulations from Chapter 816 and putting it into Chapter 761, that's the reason for that switch. We have to have a tie um, there from the permit enforceability to the ordinance. Um, planning department will be tagged in some of our reviews and vice versa. 
That's kind of how we do it right now. Our stormwater staff are tagged in all of the planning and building department reviews, whereas now we'll be able to tag other staff in our permit reviews. Um, so OpenGov has given us the ability to do that pretty, uh, hopefully pretty easily. So we will also be incorporating a um, new fee schedule. Right now we haven't been charging for any of our review time over the years. So we spend a lot of time on plan reviews, so we will be charging for that staff time. Um, we've looked at the rates for planning department reviews and have worked through um, a fee schedule that we think reflects the time it takes us to do plan reviews. The general fees for permits, um, we've included pre-construction meetings and inspection fees in that um, fee. So if it's $600 for a stormwater permit for a large site, that's going to include those inspection fees already up front for the initial inspection and the final. Um, smaller, definitely lower fees for smaller projects, single family residential. Um, those are going to be simpler, so not as costly. Um, we also have close-up procedures, including as-built documentation. That hasn't changed from our current ordinance, but I hope it's clearer and um, easier to follow in that uh, permit procedure if you're trying to close out a construction site. Um, the as-built documentation just means that we require a surveyor to provide us with information on how it was actually built compared to the original plans. If there are extreme deviations, then we would request um, maybe additional engineering or justification or modifications to the infrastructure if needed. Compliance and enforcement. Um, so this is something with our current regulations uh, being under Chapter um, 816 for the Planning Department. Um, when our inspectors go out and look at construction sites, if there are deficiencies that can't be resolved or have not been resolved, we typically would go um, to the planning department under Chapter 816 and pursue enforcement under those regulations. Um, we'll have our own enforcement procedures under this ordinance where we can issue stop work orders, notices of violation, uh, and fees um, through Chapter 115 to address deficiencies. This is a progressive enforcement program, so we have all these options available to us where our first line of action is always going to be documenting any deficiencies and providing corrective actions with a deadline. When those deadlines aren't met or the corrective actions aren't adhered to, um, then that's when we start to progress to the next level. For most sites, that documentation is usually enough. Um, but there are instances where we, we need compliance and it's just not working on a site. So that's where we get into the progressive enforcement where we take these steps so that it's not a surprise if we're going to issue a stop work order or a notice of violation with fees or fines. Um, that will not be our first step. It's usually always communication and documenting the issues first. Um, so let's see. I think that covers most of what I wanted to say on compliance and enforcement, but um, we will be doing additional outreach anyway to make sure everyone knows the new procedures. So, right. Okay. Uh, comments or questions, Commissioner Jones? Well, I, I just will comment that an, a, rather a lot of people have put a lot of time into this. Um, Thank you so much for all the time you've put in. I know that planning has been watching the whole process. The drainage board was very heavily involved and uh, really significant and important with it. And then, of course, the legal department also had to put in a huge amount of time on this. So I do want to thank everyone for the time and effort that has gone into it. I think it's a a truly improved ordinance and should work really well for most people. Uh, comments or questions, Commissioner Giffens? This is a very, very thorough document and I, I compliment you and your staff and the people in the other departments who've worked with you on this. Um, I think it'll serve the residents of the county well, both current residents and current businesses and then also people that look to build in the future. I like, I like what you talked about with the protection for people. Um, you know, one of the things we proved today in our claims was foundation work mm 
mm -hmm. through the rural housing repair. And so that, that exists sometimes because those protections were not in place. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I do appreciate, again, all the hard work and um, you and your staff and planning and legal and drainage board. Um, and it's, it's um, um, important and necessary to get this done. And um, I think that our approach to especially sinkholes and karst features is really thoughtful and well done and can't thank you enough for that because that's that's really um pardon the pun terrain that is not well explored in the in the in the country and and so i, I think it's really a, a good thoughtful way to approach it um and just like um the county development ordinance uh which we're uh continuing to work on this year um this is something that will continue to be amended as things come up so as if an issue arises or something um, new needs to be addressed uh, that's that's something that will be brought brought forward so yeah i really appreciate that i also think it's important to acknowledge the educational work that mm -hmm. the stormwater department does with contractors because i know that you do that on a regular basis Yes, we um, do hold an annual contractor's workshop, um, but I know with this new ordinance, we will need to do more outreach to some of the groups who aren't typically, um, who don't show up to the contractor's workshop. Some of the smaller companies, builders, and, and those groups will um, definitely will be reaching out to them. Hi, so. Um, so let's see if there's any public comment on this item. You can raise your hand on Teams or come to the podium in Nat U Hill. Commenters are limited to three minutes per person. Uh, if you would please give us your name and county of residence when you speak, we would appreciate it. Ms. Pearl, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jen Pearl, and I'm the president of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. Um, first, we just wanted to say thank you for all the information. I know this has been a ton of work that um, Kelsey and the whole team has done. Um, I actually just came to follow up on the last point. Um, you know, we tried to share um, your presentation last week and the other documents within our circle so folks were up to date. Um, it's a lot of information, so just to offer um, any follow-up, if we can co-host um, you know, with others across the community and even our three local government jurisdictions, because I know each of the municipalities has updated their um, ordinance on stormwater. Um, so anything we can do to try to help um, spread the word on um, all the updates so people understand them, uh, we are happy to support that. So Great. thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to offer public comment? Good morning, Wendy Goodlett, President and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Monroe County and Monroe County resident. Uh, I am just going to offer a reminder that um, anything that adds costs to building um, can quickly make a project unaffordable and we are advocating for affordable housing. So uh, I just wanna point out a couple of concerns that I have. Lots of certified professional references in here, um, which I understand and, and certainly wanna protect our groundwater and drinking water, um, but just keep in mind that those costs can add up very quickly. I'm also not certain, and this is a question I think for Kelsey, um, 761BJ1, 110% um, of total costs for all stormwater uh, measure, management measures for the entire project will be a letter of credit. Is that new? Okay, so anytime you're asking somebody to add a letter of credit, um, that comes with substantial carrying costs for, for the builder or developer. Um, so just please keep these things in mind so that we can continue having access to affordable housing and not creating unnecessary barriers. Thank you. Good morning, Randy Casty, community citizen, Monroe County resident. Uh, the question I have in regards to, I know Kelsey's worked really hard. There's been a lot of work put in by professionals, by the drainage board, and as the in-services will occur based on this being 
possibly being passed today. And they, as you look and do the in services with the contractors, smaller individuals, and we go through this, what kind of process will it take if there are suggestions and amendments that need to be made that will, it, that will actually affect the individuals doing it? If they want to make suggestions and such, I know at the planning administration meeting last night there were some fees that were passed mm -hmm. accordingly. Will those fees implement, be implemented as people ask and come up with ideas from the in-service of what of the changes that potentially could be made to help the county ordinance develop with the individuals that are actually out there doing it? Will they be, as those in-service say, well, could you change this? How will that amendment process work and what will be the cost that will have to be adhered based on our new fee schedule in order to right. make any of those changes? Right. That's um, the question. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the um, Planning Commission last night um, approved some revised fees. Some disappeared some because of some things moving to stormwater. Um, and um, also um, based in it, and the fees are based on staff time, the amount of staff time it takes to actually implement something. So uh, Ms. Thetonia, could you, um, did you have any other comment or is that, was that at your question, Mr. Cassidy? Was that it? Was that, that was it? Question. Okay. I just asked that question. Okay, I great. To yield the podium to great. you to answer. Great, thank you. I just want to make sure we didn't, yeah. So, so the question is, um, in the future, as, as we progress, uh, we do have a, a method and a system in planning. So what would you prefer uh, folks do in the community, whether uh, they're individual residents or developers or whoever, um, how they would propose a, an amendment? Sure. So I would first start by attending a county drainage board meeting. We always have a section there for public comment. Um, I prefer you contact our office so we are aware of any amendments being requested so I can prepare for it and prepare the board. But in general, the drainage board is going to be the technical review for updates to this ordinance. And then they will recommend to the commissioners um, that they adopt those amendments. There will be no fees for someone proposing or requesting these amendments. We will work with them um, to incorporate them. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and the reason there is, an, and again, it, there's not always a fee for planning either, but if somebody comes in and says, hey, we, and this actually happened, we have a proposed new landscape ordinance, and it's an ordinance, and it's um, significant, then that takes some time versus somebody who says, hey, what about this? And that, that's a different thing, and it comes through public comment, and. The drainage board meets once a month. They meet on teams and then um, also live in person. So great, thank you. Um, and I just want to make a comment about affordability. I absolutely agree that um, we have to ensure affordability, but if we don't have neighborhoods that are stable, if we don't have a drinking water supply that is clean, if we don't have uh, retention ponds that aren't eroding foundations, then it's not affordable for anybody. And so the affordability may be there up front without this kind of um, regulation, but down the road, it remains affordable then for people. And, you know, we've seen a lot of homeowners associations um, really struggle with maintaining retention ponds and then all of the residents pay for it and sometimes the whole county pays for it through stormwater fees being used um, to re remediate a problem. Um, so affordability is short term and long term and, um, and it is a very delicate balance but a very important one so I'm glad that Ms. Gula raised that so thank you for that. Um, so people should know how much their home is going to cost and if an HOA fee triples in three years that's a problem. And that's something that makes something affordable, very unaffordable, very quickly. So, uh, Mr. MG. Good morning, commissioners. It's still morning. Uh, this is Christopher MG from the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. I want to echo Ms. Pearl from the BEDC's comments about how the, how the necessity for education and outreach is on that. If the chamber can facilitate in any way we want to, I think it's important to get feedback from both residents and developers on this as we go and hopefully compiled to uh, the plan commission on that. I thought Mr. Cassidy's comments uh, hit home as well as far as amendments as we move forward. This is an important issue. Staff did a great job uh, on it. It was 
very beneficial to me just to see the presentation a second time, and so I could probably even do a third time if you're if you're willing. So, <laughs> so yeah, I want to appreciate all the work you've done and any help we can do here at the chamber. We are here for you. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'd like to point out too that part of these changes are due to state changes in state regs, and so this isn't just oh we decided to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of work has been done with um, already in terms of the outreach. Um, so we don't want we don't want folks to think that we've done absolutely zero outreach. I know that a lot of outreach work has been done, and has helped shape this this ordinance. In fact, so uh, but yes, always for the future. And um, I may suggest um, perhaps taking your uh, PowerPoint, doing an audio recording over it, putting it on our website, so that if somebody you know, they don't have to go through our meeting to find it, but they can find that um, and then uh, give folks a um, phone number, email to contact you at. Um, might be a nice um, additional educational tool. So, um, great. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Ms. Thetonia? No, at this time I just want to echo the thanks to you, the commissioners, to the County Drainage Board, to Dave Schilling in particular in the legal department who has spent many hours with me on this, um, to my staff and also to Terry Quillman who initiated all of this in 2018 yeah. and who is now part of the County Drainage Board <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, helping to oversee all this. There's been, um, I've had a lot of help along the way yeah. in the planning department. Yeah. yeah. Well, Excellent. So. Thank you. Thank you. I think he's, we're collaborating so well with so many people. Um, and that is quite a timeline, an impressive timeline when you look back at your uh, presentation about how long this is not just something we did overnight either. So um, it takes quite a bit of time to get something like this done. So thank you. All right. Um, seeing no other uh, public comment, um, I will go ahead and call for a vote on Ordinance 2024-26, the Stormwater Management um, uh, Ordinance. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries three zero. Woo. All right. Exhale. All right. Uh, we don't have any appointments today. Uh, we do have some announcements again. Um, tonight, June 5th at 6 p.m., we are meeting at the Ellisville uh, Fire Station with area residents um, about uh, to get comments and questions and to hear concerns about the potential location of our criminal justice complex at North Park, which is uh, the north uh, uh, west corner of um, uh, I-69 and State Road 46. And um, Mr. Kreider, I believe, will be there uh, tonight in addition to um, um, representative from the Sheriff's Department, and we've uh, invited all of the councils. Well, I know it's a city council meeting tonight, so I don't think they'll be there. Uh, but um, that's at 6 p.m. tonight. Um, we'd like to try to keep this to 90 minutes because that's what we asked for when we booked the space. Um, Thursday, June 6, uh, County Residents Against Annexation, um, folks who worked on the um, annexation remonstrance petitions are going to be honored at five o'clock here in the courthouse rotunda with a huge thank you uh, from everyone uh, in the community. And um, a note that uh, we are not meeting next week, uh, June 12th. We are not meeting June 19th uh, because it is Juneteenth. Uh, county government will be closed on uh, June 19th. So that um, is an important note for folks. Um, I will say that we do have office hours, uh, which continue to be held uh, six times uh, a month. And all you have to do is go to the county calendar at co.monroe.in.us and you can um, check out any of those times. So if you can't make the meeting at Ellisville, you could email any or all of us directly or call us. Our phone numbers and emails are on the county website. Also, in addition, um, we have our office hours. So it's another good place to share your comments. Um, uh, we are always accepting applications for boards and commissions. And believe it or not, it's June, and we need to start thinking about 2025. <laughs> 
Um, but we do know that we have an opening now in the Redevelopment Commission, so we invite applicants to um, apply for that, and that we will have an opening um, on the Plan Commission, and that will specifically be for um, a, um, a Republican um, member. Um, we want to um, encourage folks, especially with spring slash summer storms, to sign up for um, the resident alert system. Go to co.monroe.in.us and sign up. We also still want to encourage folks to apply through their township trustee for the rural housing repair. As we talked about earlier, um, the funds are um, gone, well spent in our community, but we may have more. And so we do ask uh, residents to contact their township trustee if they are owner occupying a house that is outside the city of Bloomington, outside the town of uh, um, Ellettsville, we will ask them to contact their township trustee. If you live in Perry Township outside the city, we ask you to contact the commissioner's office directly. We will, uh, con if we have additional funding, we will consider applications as based on the date that they were filed. Um, so, um, with that, do my colleagues have anything else to add? I'd just like to say that tomorrow is the 80th anniversary of the stormy, stormy yes. of the beaches in Normandy, also known as D-Day. And uh, it's amazing that there are still veterans from World War II who are alive and mm. who are over in France right now as part of an honor flight. Sorry, I'm getting choked up. My dad was part of World War II also. Um, but I want to acknowledge everybody that made sure that democracy lived and it wasn't just democracy in the United States. So, yeah, it's a, it's an awesome responsibility and uh, um, yeah, 80 years, unbelievable. And yeah. there are people that are there. There's still World War II veterans who were part of that invasion Absolutely. who are back there. Absolutely. Uh, anything else you wish to add? All right, we do have um, a couple of items on our work session agenda. Can we come back at 11.40? Would that work for everyone, 11.40? Okay, excellent, great. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, we appreciate you. And um, we will see you at the end of June for our regular meeting. But this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>